I want us to do this morning, and uh, um, if you have access to one of the, uh, the handouts, one of the booklets that's in the back, if you'll go to page 71 that's in there, uh, we're going to try to go through basically a, a summary of the book. What we did in this study is we spent a couple weeks, you may remember last year, uh, a couple weeks, an introduction to the book, uh, and then we, uh, uh, we spent several weeks uh, looking at the first two chapters uh, because those chapters are so uh, integral uh, to the study of the book. And then we tried to just cover a chapter, uh, a chapter per week uh, during that. And Gene, I think they're all, uh, they're all out there. But the overview of the book, it has a significant place in God's whole plan. It has a significant place in the New Testament. Uh, if you go to the gospel accounts, you read about Jesus and his life. You read about his, God's desire uh, through Christ to save man. And then you get to the book of Acts. And what does the book of Acts show us? What does it teach us? It teaches us how to be saved. The gospels say God sent Jesus and he wants you to be saved. You get to the book of Acts and it says here's how, you, here's how you can be saved. Here's what God wants you to do in order to be saved and to become a part of his church. And so we're introduced to the concept of the church in the gospel accounts. But when you get to the book of Acts... We are given a detailed account of the establishment of his church, uh, of the growth of his church, and that's, uh, that's where this book comes to, uh, to play such a, uh, such a key part in our, in our study of, uh, of the New Testament. And then there are a number of these uh, strategic truths uh, that are taught throughout this book. And some of these may seem obvious to you, but these are emphasized in the book of Acts, and, and hopefully we, uh, we get this emphasis uh, as we go through the study that Jesus died, he was raised from the dead, and he sits at the right hand of God. Uh, and that he's not just a man, he is the Christ, the Son of God, he's the Lord of all. And it's his authority that, that uh, is essential uh, in all that we do. He is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. He came to establish his church, and the purpose of that church is to seek and to save the lost. And it's not just any old way uh, that God has put on this earth. Number seven on letter B there, it is the way that God has for man to get to heaven. And so there's just a, a general overview. In the first lesson, back in the lesson number one, we looked at what's the main theme? What's the primary theme of, of the book of Acts? And uh, the primary theme is that New Testament Christianity came into existence. God had been preparing the world for thousands of years for Christianity to come on the scene. You get to the book of Acts and all of a sudden, here it is. Uh, it's established. You see, it's, uh, you see it spreading. You see it growing. Uh, and you see all of this uh, in spite of the persecution that there was against the church. How much persecution did the early church face? Is there a little bit? Uh, I want you, if, if you've got one of the books, look on page 71, and we'll try to summarize it here on the screen. But I want you, and I don't want you to just see this as a list. I want you to get the sense of what the early church went through. This isn't just, a, and, and I've tried to put in here every time that there was opposition to the church in the book of Acts, but I don't want you to see this as a list. Put yourself back in this situation. Put yourself in this first 30 years of being a Christian. What would you have done if you had endured these, endured these things? In chapter 4, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem greatly, were greatly disturbed because of New Testament preaching. And so Peter and John were arrested, imprisoned. They were put on trial. They were severely threatened and then further threatened. And then they were commanded, don't you ever speak in Jesus' name again. In chapter 5, the Jewish leaders were again filled with indignation against the apostles. And so they arrested the apostles, imprisoned them, put them on trial, and they plotted to kill them. Put yourself in this situation. This is the early days of Christianity, and already there are plots being made to kill the people who are preaching uh, about Christ. And so the apostles are beaten and commanded not to speak. In chapter 6 and 7, Stephen becomes the first martyr. Stephen is killed. He's, not only, he's falsely accused, arrested, put on trial, and then eventually stoned to death because he was preaching the gospel. In Acts chapter 8, a great persecution arose. It caused the church to be scattered. We read about Saul of Tarsus who brought havoc against the church, persecuting the church. Can you imagine, Acts chapter 8 says he entered into their homes. You think he had an invitation? You know, you think he was responding to a potluck dinner? You know, he entered the Christians' 
homes. To do what? To drag them out of their homes to commit them to prison in order that they might be threatened, beaten, and ultimately put to death. Why? Because they're a Christian. Because they claim to follow Christ. Put yourself back in this situation where Paul was doing this because he had received authority. It wasn't just Paul in some, in some crazy moment in his own mind. He had received authority from the Jewish authorities to go and to find these Christians and to bring them back uh, to Jerusalem and put them on trial. Well, of course, Paul is converted to Christ. And uh, as soon as he's converted, what do the Jews do? They turn on him. And start to plot to kill him. In Acts chapter 12, uh, Herod persecutes the church and murders the first apostle. Uh, for, murders the first apostle to be killed in James. And then he arrests Peter with the same idea of putting him to death. Uh, when you read about Paul on his first missionary journey, you read about a number of uh, things that opposed Christianity. You read about uh, Elamis withstanding and seeking to turn people away from obeying the truth. Uh, you read about a persecution in, uh, in Pisidia where Paul was kicked out of a city. Have you ever been kicked out of a city? I know sometimes, you know, somebody may face some sort of eviction process where they're kicked out of their, uh, kicked out of their home or their apartment. Have you ever been kicked out of a city where, where the city officials came and, and forced you out? Paul was forced out. Why? Because he's preaching about Jesus. Uh, in Iconium. There was a, uh, the, the minds of the people were stirred up and poisoned against Christianity until they were uh, uh, tried to stone them there in Iconium, and so they left. Ultimately, Paul went down to Lystra, and he was stoned. They thought that he was dead. That was the whole purpose of stoning someone, was to kill them. Here was Paul. What's he doing? Preaching about Jesus. How are people reacting? They're threatening him. They are stirring up the crowd against him, and here they stone him, thinking that they had put him to death. On his second missionary journey, same kind of thing, where there is, uh, where there is uh, uh, uproar, there is a stirring of the crowds against Christianity, there's opposition. On his third missionary journey, the same kind of thing. This is where we read in Acts chapter 19 about the riot that took place in the city of Ephesus and, uh, and all that went on there because of Christianity. And then in the last 25% of the book, you read the book of Acts, you get to chapter 21. The last 25% of the book, what do we read about? We read about Paul being arrested, being in prison, being put on trial, having false accusations brought against him. We read about him uh, being beaten. We read about him over this period of years being uh, cruelly treated. For what purpose? For what reason? Because he had been preaching about Jesus. I don't want you to see this as a list. I want you to get the sense of the tremendous opposition that Christianity faced. And I want you to go back and put yourself uh, in that situation. What would you have done? What would I have done? When we get back there and we see that much, we, we are opposed, not, not just, <clears throat> we're not just talking about freedom of speech. We're not just talking about whether their First Amendment rights, they didn't have any, whether their First Amendment rights were being in, 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 encroached upon. We're talking about individuals being beaten and murdered because they believe in Jesus. Now, how is the church, it's in its infancy, how is the church going to survive in that kind of environment? How's it going to could it possibly survive if there's that much opposition? Wouldn't it, just be, wouldn't it just be squashed and put out of existence? Well, pardon? If the Lord is with us, who can be against us? Look at, uh, look at page, if, you've got it, if you've got the booklet, look on page 73. And again, I don't want you to see this as some list uh, of things. We just saw... In, in a nutshell, how much opposition there was to Christianity. What happened to the church? What happened to Christianity? In Acts chapter 2, 3,000 souls 
were baptized and added to the Lord's church. Chapter 2 and verse 47, the Bible says, He kept on adding to the church. Look at the bold text if you've got one of these handouts. Down page 73. In chapter 4, many more believed and the number became 5,000. In chapter 5, believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes of men and women. In chapter 6, the number of the disciples was multiplying. Remember all the opposition? Where was all this coming from? The number of the disciples was multiplying. The word of God kept spreading and the number of the disciples kept on multiplying greatly. A great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. In Acts chapter 8, multitudes in Samaria uh, were converted. In chapter 9, in the cities of Lydda and Sharon and Joppa, uh, all of the people heard and many were converted. In chapter 11, a great number were taught and converted in the city of Antioch. In chapter 12, the word of God continued to grow and to multiply. In chapter 13, Almost everyone in Antioch of Pisidia heard the gospel. In chapter 14, a great multitude of Jews and Greeks in Iconium and, Der and Derbe uh, were converted. Uh, in chapter 16, the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in number daily. In chapter 17, uh, there were many devout Greeks in Thessalonica who were converted and many Bereans. In chapter 18, there were many Jews and Greeks in Corinth who were converted. In chapter 19, you go to the city of Ephesus, and there's many in Ephesus who were converted. And, and while Paul is there for three years, everybody in Asia heard the word of God proclaimed, and the word of God prevailed and multiplied throughout the region. Now, how does that happen? How can there be so much opposition and then be so much growth? That, that seems backwards. If there was that much opposition, shouldn't it be diminishing, decreasing? Vanishing? Dirk? Right? That's right. It's, it's what Gamaliel told the council in Acts chapter 5 uh, when they were uh, opposing the apostles. He said, look, just leave them alone. If it's of man, it, it'll, it'll destroy itself. If it's of God, there's nothing you can do. Carolyn? That's right. That's right. What was the church what, what, was the church growing in spite of the persecution or was the church growing because of the persecution? No, you could say both. But what does that affirm? It affirms the second statement is true. That because there was persecution against the church the church grew, and, it, and it's what Carolyn said, and it's what we're trying to emphasize, and that is these Christians were fully convinced that what they had been taught and what they believed was absolutely true. There was not, there was not within them any desire to, to back down from their faith that Jesus is the Son of God. We don't face opposition like what we've read about in this book. We don't face that kind of opposition today. Not on, not on any level. And yet, how's the church doing? Are, are we as determined? When, when, when we face the, the types of suppression and opposition that we face today... How determined are we not just to survive, not just to survive and make it through the hard times, but to overcome and triumph and bring others in and cause others to be converted to Christ? That, that's, the whole, we, that's the theme of the book. When you go to page 74 in your book, the main purpose of the book is to, is to show us people being converted. Not just the growth. That's, that's, that's the result of the conversions. The result of the conversions is the growth and the spread of Christianity. But one, one of the main purposes of this book 
is to detail for us how people were being converted. Isn't that why Jesus came? Jesus came and died on the cross. Why? So that people could be saved. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we read about Jesus coming, dying on the cross so that people could be saved. We get to the book of Acts, and what do we read? We read about people being saved. We read about how they were being saved. And, and as you read through these, uh, you know, it's what you have to do is recognize that these people were responding to a message that was promising to wash away their sins. They knew. They knew that responding and being obedient to the gospel that was being proclaimed to them was going to save them in the eyes of God. And what's interesting is you read, as you read this book and you read about these multiple examples, these multiple cases of conversion. You think God knew that we are, we are a type of creature that we can read the commandments and understand them. But if we can see a picture of somebody doing it, if we, can, if we can have an example of somebody following the commandments that were given. You know, some of us are, some, some of us are, are we can learn just by, just by reading it, hearing the text. Some of us are visual learners. We got to see it. What does the book of Acts do for us? Both. It lets us see it. We get to see people doing what Jesus said to do. What, what should that do for us? Well, it ought to reaffirm for us that what Jesus said is real. What Jesus said is true and absolutely necessary. But then when we see them doing it, should that not also be a, a, a time where we say, one, that's what I need to do. And if I've already done it, two, that's what I need to help other people do. And so you look in... Uh, you look in the book of Acts, and this is on page 74, letter D of your, uh, of your handout. And uh, we don't have these on the screen if you didn't get one of the handouts. But I want you to think about these number of conversions that took place. And what does it say that they did? The 3,000 Jews on the day of Pentecost were pricked in the heart, repented. They were baptized. In chapter 4, there were many more in Jerusalem who heard the word and believed. Chapter 6 and verse 7 there were a great many priests who were obedient to the faith. In chapter 4, there were multitudes in Samaria who heard the word, received it, heeded it, believed it, and were baptized. In chapter, in, on page 75, in chapter 8, Simon the sorcerer believed and was baptized. The Ethiopian eunuch heard the word, believed, confessed his faith, and he was baptized. Saul of Tarsus in chapter 9 heard the message from Ananias and was baptized, calling on the name of the Lord. In chapter 9, those in Lydda, Sharon, and Joppa turned to the Lord. They believed on the Lord. In chapter 10, Cornelius and his household heard the word, received the word, believed the word, repented, and they were baptized. In chapter 11, a great many in Antioch believed and turned to the Lord. Sergius Paulus believed. Gentiles in Antioch of Pisidia believed. Great multitude in Iconium believed. And many in Derby. many disciples were made in Derby. In Philippi, in chapter 16, Lydia and her household heard the word and were baptized. And uh, the jailer at the end of Acts chapter 16 heard the word, believed it, and was baptized. In chapter uh, 17, though the great multitudes in Thessalonica were persuaded, and many in Berea uh, were persuaded and believed. And then later on in chapter 17, there were some in Athens who believed. In chapter 18 in Corinth, there were many who were persuaded by hearing the word, believing it, they were baptized. In Ephesus, there were men who heard the word and were baptized. What, what happens if you take all of, these gospel, all of these accounts of conversion, what happens if you take them and put all of them together? What do you get? You get a full, complete picture what somebody needs to do in order to become a Christian. Now, what did Jesus teach? Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. I got two things. Believe and be baptized. That's Mark's account. In Matthew's account, what did he say? Go therefore and make disciples. What's a disciple? The disciples were first called 
Christians in Antioch. What's a disciple? A Christian. How is a disciple, how is a Christian made in Matthew 28 and verse 19? Go therefore make disciples of all the nations by doing what? Baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we have, you've got to believe, you've got to be baptized. In Luke's account, in Luke chapter 24 and verse 47, Jesus uh, in the Great Commission there said that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name to all nations. Jesus said, go and preach that people need to believe, they need to repent, and they need to be baptized. We get to the book of Acts, and what do we see people doing? Why are these people believing? Why are they repenting? Why are they being baptized? Because that's what Jesus said to do. And when you take all of these accounts of conversion and you put them together, you have a full, complete picture what somebody needs to do to become a Christian. I know some people come to some of these conversions and say, look, there were some who were converted, like in Berea, uh, like in Athens, and all it says they did was believe. It just says they believed. They are converted to Christ, and all they did was believe. Well, we had a lesson a long time ago. It's now Lesson 33 in your book. Uh, lesson 33 in your book is about how does the book of Acts use the word believe? How does the Bible, how does the book of Acts use the word believe? It does not use it the way people use it today. We need to use the word believe the way that the Bible uses it, not the way that, that, uh, that man's trying to use it today. How does the Bible, how does the book of Acts use the word believe? Not just some mental ascent, sure, I'll buy into that. Not just some, not just some uh, point where I come and say, sure, I, I believe, I, I understand that, I'll accept that. But belief as we have it in the book of Acts was a complete obedience to what God said to do. If somebody truly believes what God says, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to do what He says. We take, that, we take all of these conversion accounts and we put them together and we understand that someone must believe, they must repent, they must confess, they must be baptized, uh, they must do all of these things, not because a church teaches them to do that. That's not, that's not Church of Christ doctrine. That's Book of Acts doctrine. That's just coming to the Bible and say, what does the Bible say? Get, 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 rid of, get rid of our human or our man-made doctrines and traditions. Get rid of those and just, you sit down and read the Book of Acts. And people, people have done this. People who did not believe that baptism was essential for salvation have, have sat down, they've read the Book of Acts, and they come away saying, wow, I was wrong. You really do have to be baptized. Notice how many times baptism is emphasized in these accounts of conversion. Dirk? Say, I missed the first part of what you said. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's interesting how that word legalist is thrown around. and It can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing. Or Are you one? Am I one? Uh, you know, the Bible, the Bible doesn't use... Uh, the word legalist, you know, if you look up in a concordance, uh, you're not going to find uh, the word legalist. But uh, when, uh, when the apostles were told, stop preaching in the name of Jesus, what did Peter respond in Acts 5 and verse 29? We ought to obey God rather than man. What does that say? If God says it, that's what I got to do. And instead of obeying God, or instead of obeying man and what man thinks I ought to do, I just need to obey God. So we, we've approached, in, in this overview this morning, we've approached this uh, kind of in reverse. We've seen the spread of the church. Well, how did the church spread? The church was spreading. New Testament Christianity was growing because people were being converted. Now, why were they being converted? How were they being converted? You've got to look at the preaching that was taking place. You've got to come back and see what kind of preaching was leading these people to be converted, which was causing the church to grow. What were they preaching? And we don't have time to go back and, and look at all of this. You, you can take time uh, to look through these uh, and see. We won't read all of these. There's a lot of them. But what did they preach? They preached the gospel. What is the gospel? The good news. The good news about what? The good news that Jesus died, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, that Jesus died, 
according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised again on the third day according to the Scriptures. They were going around preaching that. They were preaching the gospel, and everywhere they went, the heart of their message uh, was about Jesus. Notice on page 77, just uh, there's a number of ways they referred to Jesus. They referred to Him sometimes not only as the Christ, they referred to Him as your holy servant, Jesus. They referred to Him as the just one. They referred to Him as the author of life in and, and, and a number of different ways, but every time they went preaching. Do you remember in Acts 8? When this man was riding along in the chariot, this Ethiopian, Philip comes and intercepts him, says, do you understand what you're reading? He gets into the chariot. Where was this man reading from? The New York Times? Washington Post? Where's he reading from? Book of Isaiah. This man's reading from the book of Isaiah, specifically Isaiah 53, and he asked Philip, who's Isaiah talking about? Is he talking about himself or is he talking about some other man? And the Bible says in Acts 8 and verse 35 that Philip began at that point, right there in the scripture where he's reading, he began at that point and preached unto him, and the Bible only gives us one word that he preached. What did he preach unto him? Jesus. What does that mean? Did Philip just sit there in the chariot and say, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Is that, is, that, is that what he did? What does it mean to preach unto somebody Jesus? You preach, what did Jesus do? He came to this earth from heaven. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross. He was raised from the dead and he went to heaven. You preach, why did Jesus do that? I mean, you can preach what Jesus did all day long, but if you don't preach why he did it, it doesn't matter what he did. Why did he do it? So that we could be saved from our sins. He left the splendor of heaven going to the cross to take upon Himself not just the agony of the cross, to take upon Himself our sins. But if you preach what Jesus did and you preach why Jesus did it, but you don't preach what Jesus expects of us in response, you haven't done the person any good. You can tell them what he did and why he did it, but if you don't tell them what they need to do in order to get right with the Lord, you've left them hanging. You haven't helped them. Hmm, isn't it interesting that when the Bible says that Philip preached unto him Jesus, what do we know he preached? They came into some water, and the, and the Ethiopian said, Look, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Excuse me, where'd you hear that word? All Philip's been saying is Jesus, 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 Jesus. Where'd you get an idea of being baptized? Look, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? And he said, and if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And the, and the Ethiopian said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Wait a minute, where'd you get that idea? When you preach, unto him, un, when you preach Jesus, you've got to preach who Jesus was and what he did. You preach why he did it, and then you preach, here's what you've got to do in order to respond to that message. And in preaching Jesus, that's what they did. The content on page 78 the content of their message uh, was very much, the, uh, they preached the scripture, the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. They preached the nature of God. They preached Jesus, His crucifixion, His resurrection. By the way, why did, why did, uh, Paul, why did Paul say that he was continually on trial? Remember when he went before Felix, went before Festus, went before Agrippa, standing before the Jewish leaders in Rome in Acts chapter 28? Why did Paul say he was on trial? He's on trial. Sometimes he would say, for the hope of Israel. Why was he on trial? Because, of the resur because he was preaching in Jesus the resurrection. Not only preaching... Jesus' resurrection, but he's preaching that all men at some time are going to be raised from the dead. You know, for us, that's a, that's a fundamental concept. Uh, in fact, uh, we don't have time to look at this, but in fact, in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1, the, the, the Christians that are being written to in the book of Hebrews, were in their, they were not growing as they should be growing. They should have become teachers by this point, but they weren't even teachers. 
So the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 6 and verse 1 says, instead of, instead of growing, I need to come back to you and I need to teach you again the ABCs of Christianity. It's literally what he's talking about, the fundamental principles of Christianity. And one of the things listed in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 is resurrection, the resurrection, the resurrection from the dead. That's fundamental. For us, that's basic. We know Jesus was raised from the dead. We know that at the end of time, all people are going to be raised from the dead. But why was Paul arrested and imprisoned and beaten? Because he preached that Jesus was raised from the dead and that one day all people will be raised from the dead. That was a foreign concept uh, back then. They preached Christ. They preached the authority of Christ. They preached the kingdom of God. They preached the hope of the Christian, and that is the resurrection. They preached the way of salvation. They preached that once you're a Christian, you need to remain faithful. Uh, and then you look at number 9, page 79. You look at the method of their preaching, and involved in their preaching was not just... You know, it would be interesting for preachers all around the globe, no matter what religious affiliation... No matter what group they are a part of, it would be interesting for them to read through the book of Acts and see what type of preaching they did in the book of Acts. It wasn't all feel good, let me tell you some stories and make you laugh kind of preaching. I didn't make these words up. These are the words that are used in the book of Acts for the kind of preaching they did. They reasoned. There was reasoning, explaining, testifying, exhorting, proclaiming, persuading, Warning, commending, encouraging, defending, strengthening. When they went around preaching, they, they took their responsibility seriously uh, to make sure that those individuals who they preached to understood what they needed to do to be saved because in reality, letter F, that is the ultimate goal of preaching is to get people to be saved. And of course, we've already talked about uh, uh, what they needed to do in order to become saved. And the emphasis, it's interesting, the emphasis that the book of Acts places on baptism, as much as uh, there's controversy today over whether baptism is essential for salvation or not, uh, the book of Acts makes it very clear that it was definitely essential. And then you come to the last point, page 81, if you've got the booklet We've looked at the main purpose, the, the, the strategic position the book of Acts has in the Bible and the New Testament. We've looked at the main theme, and that being that New Testament Christianity was spreading. It was growing. How was it growing? It was growing because people were being converted to it. That doesn't just mean they were joining the group. That doesn't just mean they were getting members to pay their dues and, and their fees to get a part of the group. What does it mean to be converted they were changed over, converted to the truth of Christianity. Now, how, were, how did that come about? It came about because of the preaching. Because they believed the preaching that was being done about Jesus, uh, about Christianity, about what they needed to do in order to be saved. Now, when these people were converted, when they became Christians, what else did they become? And we could go to the New Testament and find other words to add to this. Obviously, we are limiting uh, this study to what we find in the book of Acts. But once they're converted, their identity as an individual changed. What did they become known as individually? They became known as, oh, that's the person who believes. wonder if we could be called these things. Oh, that, that's the person who believes. They became known as disciples. Disciples are not just followers. That's not just the definition. Disciples are learners. They continue to learn. They continue to grow. They were called brethren. They were called saints. Living, breathing people in the Bible were called saints. They weren't dead before they became a saint. Here in the first time we read the word Christian. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. The, the Christians were called those who believe on His name, those who call on His name. They were called servants. I wonder if somebody was looking for a word to call us 
if they would call us a servant or a servant of the Most High God or to call us, oh, those are the people that are sanctified. Or today they might look at us and say, oh, you're a Christian. You're different. I wonder if somebody would say that about us. Here's individual identities of how these Christians were identified on an individual basis, and then they became a part of a collective body, and obviously that collective body had its own identity. They were obviously a part of the church, but what's another name for the church? It's called the kingdom. They were referred to as the multitude of those who believed, the multitude of the disciples. Multiple times in the book of Acts, the church is referred to as the way. That's interesting because sometimes that word was not only used by the Christians, but it was used by their enemies to refer to them. In Acts chapter 9, when Paul was making his way to Damascus to persecute Christians, in Acts 9 and verse 2, it says that he was going to Damascus to see if he could find anyone who was of the way. What is that? How would he, is that like stamped across their forehead? Is that, how do you find somebody who is of the way? They're living differently. They're walking differently. They're not concerned about man's way. They're only concerned about one way, the way, God's way. When you come to the book of Acts, I've tried to, give just a brief overview this morning to try to finalize our study of this book. Come to the book of Acts. Don't, don't neglect this book and your study of the New Testament and your study of the Bible. As Christians, we need to make sure that we know this book. We need to make sure we know what it teaches. As New Testament Christians, we need to make sure that we can come to the book of Acts and use it to defend New Testament Christianity. If this was a book that helped New Testament or, or reflected the growth of New Testament Christianity, for sure it can be a book that can help us to defend New Testament Christianity. Can we defend the church? Can we defend the, God's plan of salvation? Can we defend the truth of the Scripture? Here's a great book for us to know, to study. If you did not get one of the handouts, again, those are, um, it was the full booklet of everything we've studied. Uh, those are available on Amazon.com if you want to go there. If you'd rather, I can uh, try to print off some more and give you a copy, but uh, I want to make sure everybody has that available for their own studies. Thank you for your good attention and participation this morning.